as the grandson, son, son-in-law of veterans, and now with one serving in the military, I do want to thank those of you who have paved the way, who have been an example and have served our country and protected those overseas as well. So today on Getting Ready for Veterans Day, we want to say thank you for your service to our country. Today, just as our title of this series says, the church truly does start to go viral. We are going to see it leave the boundaries of the area where it's been and where it's been shared and where God has been moving. And it's going to move beyond what has been known and what has been uh, expected. The who of who makes up the church is about to change, and it's something new. It is going to literally change everything. Now, the term literally has literally been overused recently, but in this case, it's true. I had a family member who was talking to my wife and I, and she made the comment about something that was uh, so overwhelming to her, and she said, my head literally exploded. And we we're like, no, no, it didn't. But in this case, when we say literally, the literal is true. And we're going to start by reading uh, Acts chapter 10. We're going to read a large chunk of passage at the front end. But you have to understand, this new that's about to hit is very similar to what we would experience today in that it makes people then uncomfortable. It's going to change things up. And they didn't like change back then any more than we like it today. Acts chapter 10 beginning at verse 1. Feel free to use your mobile device if you have the, the YouVersion Bible app. Follow along in the Seatback Bible. But let's begin reading. Acts 10, beginning at verse 1. It says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven while Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision. The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I've sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. So as we look at the main players of what's going on in Acts 10, we start with this gentleman named Cornelius. And Cornelius, first of all, is a Gentile, and that's important because Jews didn't want much to do with Gentiles. Secondly, he is a Roman army official, which if you know anything about the Romans, they were very oppressive in the lands that they went into. Not real popular in their day and age. And he's leading, as we'll see in a moment, he lives in Caesarea, 
which is the headquarters of the government for the entire Palestine region. Cornelius is a man of influence. He follows or he leads approximately 6,000 men under him into battle. 6,000 men. One uh, person I read says his rank back then, if you were ever in the army, is about the equivalent of a sergeant major today. So he has high responsibility, very high profile, but we also know about Cornelius, he's a God-fearing man. He may be a Gentile, and the Romans may have their pantheon of gods and may live lives that are completely counter to what the, the Hebrew God has called us to live, to what God, as we know, has called us to live, but he realizes there's something different about this Jewish God about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's described as a God-fearing man, and this God-fearing makes him what, what's described as, as characteristically kind. He's good to people. As he understand how God has treated him, he in turn begins to treat others in love. We saw this last week with Tabitha, that as they get a hold of God's heart, all of a sudden they start having a heart for the poor and the needy and the outcast. They start having a heart to do good. Cornelius was influential. He's a man after God's heart. He also is described as characteristically kind. Cornelius was also, as we see in this passage, a man of prayer. He may not even fully have understood who, who he was praying to. But there's something about him, there's something intrinsically that understands that there's someone out there beyond the Roman pantheon, beyond the immorality of what he had seen in the Greek life. There's something very real. Jesus would say to people like this constantly, you're not far from the kingdom. You're not far. There's a lot that you get, but then, as Jesus would say, there's some that I've come to fulfill that you have to understand. That's going to be Peter's role here. But before Cornelius can get it, before he can listen to the message from Peter, something has to change in Peter. Because the Jews wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles. They saw them as extra in life because life is really all about us. And that had to change for Peter. And that's where this vision happened. Let's pick up reading now at verse 23. It says, The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made them get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I, sent, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Now verse 30 through 33, Cornelius restates the vision that he's had uh, going on from there to vo verse 43. Peter begins to spell out Cornelius' and all of our need for Christ. What Jesus has done for us in his death, his burial, and his resurrection in our place for our rebellion against God, that we can have life, and life abundantly, life, as the Bible calls it, eternal, because of what Christ has done. Peter gives his audience a history lesson from the Old Testament, just as Luke continually does in this book, from the Old Testament to the New, and then what it means for us today. We hop to verse 44. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on, even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Now this is a total change up for this previously Jewish church. If you'll remember in Acts 1, the, the prophecy is given that this message will start in Jerusalem and Judea and then go to Samaria, 
Jews in Samaria, not so much. They just don't get along. And yet in Acts 8, we see this outpouring in Samaria. And now we're seeing it fulfilled, the Acts 1-8 fulfilled, and that it's about to hit the ends of the world. The next five chapters after Acts 10 in the book of Acts are going to change everything. So with this change in mind, what can we take away from then to now that still stands for us today? First of all, we see the Holy Spirit doesn't change. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. The practices we see in Acts 10 and throughout uh, Scripture, we see it happening today as well. Things such as prayer. Prayer is still vibrant and necessary for the church to be alive, whether it's prayer like the, the worship and prayer night we had on Tuesday, or maybe what you do in your quiet times or in your car as you're driving to work or to school. Prayer is still integral to the strong and vibrant life of a Christian callings. God still calls people to tasks, to purposes, to places, to people. God is still moving and calling. He's still using visions and dreams. Acts 1 told us that this would be something that would happen. That young men would dream, old men would have visions. But dreams and visions are still at work in the church. If you missed last week's message here in Bellevue, Adam spoke about how God is speaking in the Middle East to people where missionaries are illegal. And yet God bypasses all of that, and His Holy Spirit is speaking to people through dreams and visions. God is still moving. The message of Christ has not changed, and the Holy Spirit is still prompting people's hearts to receive it. The Bible says that message can't and won't change. And the Spirit brings it to life within us. We also see throughout Acts, and Luke makes it known, it's one of the major themes in, in his book in the Bible, is that caring for the poor is still a responsibility of the church. It's not for the government. It's not for any organization. There is a responsibility to the widow, the orphan, the homeless, the foreigner in your land, and the outcast that the Bible never allows the church to abdicate, to hand off. The Holy Spirit has prompted us and called us to be faithful in these things. And also, throughout the book of Acts and the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit has and does give gifts. Now, there's lists of gifts in Timothy and Galatians and Romans and Corinthians and, and Titus, and none of those lists are supposed to be all-inclusive, but there's gifts that we see on those lists that we love. I love people with the gift of hospitality. Those are my favorite. I love people with the gift of faith, and I want them praying for me. Or the, the gift of generosity. We love those gifts. Gifts of teaching. Oh, that's a good gift. But there are still gifts in practice today that sometimes they've been so abused or misrepresented that we don't want anything to do with them. One of those gifts that we see over and over again in the book of Acts is this gift of tongues. We saw it in Acts 2 used one way, and the word for this in, in the Greek is glossolalia. In Acts 2, he gives them the ability to speak in a language that everyone would understand. Glossolalia. In, in Acts 10, it's Cornelius and his family. And they speak in a tongue that isn't needed for everyone to understand their family. They already understand, so it happens in a different way. I want to look at two other passages. They'll be on the screen. First one is 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. How many of you would say wisdom is still around today? Yes? Okay, social media, maybe not, but... For the most part, it's around. To another, the message of knowledge, that's a good thing, to an, of the same spirit. To another, faith of the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes to each one just as he determines. Does it say that everybody gets every gift? Let's try it again. Does it say that everybody gets every gift? No, it doesn't, but he does give gifts, and all of these gifts are gifts the Holy Spirit is still using. These gifts, it says, are for what? They are for the, the edifying, 
of the church. This gift of tongues is not so one person can hold a microphone, speak in a language no one knows to show you spiritual authority. That's not what the gift of tongues is. It is for the edification of the body. The Holy Spirit uses it in different ways, in different situations. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. It says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Acts 2, everybody understood. Acts 10, it's in a specific group of people. Acts uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it says it's a language that people don't understand. It's between you and God. This gift, this glossolalia is still around today. It does not show that you are a upper level 37 Christian because you have the gift. It does not uh, mean that there's a third work of grace. It's a gift. It's a gift that's been given to the body like hospitality, like teaching, like faith like service, like administration. We don't ignore the gifts. We recognize God is still using these. For, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 39 and 40 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. It's not meant for sheer chaos. It has its place within the body. It is a gift. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. He's still pouring these out. But here's the, th the next thing I would say. The Holy Spirit does change things. The Holy Spirit changes things. We see the light bulb go on for Peter in verse 34 when he says, then Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now I know what that vision was about. God loves more people than just me. God loves more people than just my friends or the people I like. God is in the process here of shaking things up. And I would say to you, the Holy Spirit still shake things up. He, I would say count on it. He has to shake his church up. Because we will default to comfort. We will default to what we like. We will stand behind the stained glass windows and say, this is what I'm comfortable with. In Acts 1, we talked about one of the names of the Holy Spirit, which is the parakletos, which means the comforter. And we think of comfort, and we go straight to comfortable. We think of a nice, big, fuzzy sweater or blanket, which you will need this week. We think of big, fuzzy socks and a cup of hot cocoa, and we say, this is the Holy Spirit. But this idea of comforter is not to be comfortable. The word here translates a similar word as bravery. The comforter is the one who fills us with courage and strength for the task and the calling. We can be comforted with, because of who goes into battle with us and who's gone before us. The Holy Spirit does and will shake things up in a way that maybe we're uncomfortable with. In Acts 10 through Acts 15, we're going to see a change happen in church leadership. The Apostle Peter, who we just finally started getting used to. I mean, Peter was kind of a knucklehead in the, in the Gospels, and now he's stepping up. It looks like he's getting this rhythm with the church thing. I like Peter. Acts 10 to 15, his voice becomes a little less frequent after Acts 15. We never hear from Peter again. Gone. We don't know why, but God has changed up the leadership of the church. And many of us would go, well, then, then give us John. John wrote a book on love. I like John. It's not John. Give us one of the other apostles. I'll even take Thomas. He doubted, but he came back. Nope. It's Saul, the one who persecuted you, the one who was ready to throw you in jail. If I told you this morning, and I'm just, just go with me on this, let's say that God said, you got two, three years left at Spring Lake that I'm going to call you on as some, to another role or somewhere else, and I'm going to bring a different pastor in for Spring Lake. How would you feel if I told you this morning the next pastor of Spring Lake is possibly waking up in a crack house this morning? 
How would you feel if I told you he wasn't studying for seminary exams? He was running from the cops. God sometimes will work outside the bubble to bring his church to a new place. We have to understand that sometimes it can be uncomfortable. And I want to springboard off of that for a section, for just a section, because I want to talk about what do you do when God shakes things up, and part of it may lead to, Lord, maybe I'm supposed to be at a different church. Maybe he called you here that way, or he has stirred you, or some of your friends, and you've watched them go, and you're going, what's this all about? I would say to you, and this is, this is Jack, okay, 30 years of uh, in ministry and just some of the things I've seen. But I would say this, there's, there's usually two reasons someone will, will change churches. The first one is assignment. Maybe God is stirring you to go help another pastor, another church, or another ministry. Maybe there's something they're getting started or a church has been struggling. Maybe it's a season in your life that there's something that's being taught and, and God has you on assignment and, and moves you. I met with a couple who was leaving Spring Lake for that very reason. And they, they had never left the church before, but they really felt the call to go and help another pastor. And I told them, I was like, look, if you're going to help, if you're going in ministry, go and I want to pray with you. But if you're going to sit on a seat and take up space, I think you're missing the bigger purpose. You see, people will either leave an assignment, and I understand they say that when a church doubles, it, sometimes a church can become, that's the point where people get uncomfortable. We've We've more than doubled in the last six years. And I know for some, that's a, that's a stretching point where they can go and be on assignment somewhere else. We saw that in Acts 7 and 8 when the church was scattered. God used that to, to spark the preaching of the gospel in other places. But that's leaving for assignment. The second way people leave is they leave mad. They leave angry at a pastor, an elder, a teacher, or the coffee. It's something, you know, really deep. <laughs> they leave mad. And you'll know the difference when you hear people speak. They're either speaking forward and what God is calling them to, or they'll speak backward at how mad they are at what they left. One is an assignment. The other is a sin. We want to do this well. God will shake his church up, and sometimes he will prompt us to a move. That's how I ended up here. We knew there was a new season coming. My wife and I, in agreement, made the move from Florida. We won't go there. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to let people go. Sometimes if you're in ministry or a ministry leader and you're wondering, why did they leave? And, and Can we be real? People are people. There will be talking. There will be rumors. People will read their own interpretation into what's going on. But sometimes God moves things and the Holy Spirit will shake things up. And that's okay. And we have to be okay with that. And this brings us to the last point, the last takeaway is, even when we don't understand, we need to remain faithful. Remain faithful even when there's a lack of clarity. I love what verse 17 says. It says, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision. Peter doesn't have this thing down, but now there's three guys standing at the gate. And remember, they're Gentiles, so they can't even come in the house. Uh, is there a guy named Peter here? Peter, yeah. What do you want? Uh, we had a vision from the Lord. Uh, what about? Well, it was actually Cornelius. Okay, come in. And then he goes to their land, which a Jew should not have done. We, we saw that in the passage. You don't always get clarity. God doesn't always send a notification with what he wants to do with you, in you, to you. You don't always get a notification. Verse 48 it says that at the last verse, it says, then Cornelius and family asked Peter to stay around. Think about this from Cornelius' perspective. You are an influential person. You have just called for a Jew to come into your house who is not of rank and file, so he's not this important person, and he, pro he may not even show up. He may turn you down. So you are humbling yourself to even ask him to come to your house he comes to your house, he starts talking about this Jesus who is God, and the next thing I know I'm speaking in tongues. Somebody explain something. Peter hangs around. You don't always get all the answers up front. In the closing of the message today, in the closing of the service, 
I would like us, all of us, to kind of look inside and say, Holy Spirit, how are you prompting me? It may be someone he's put on your heart to talk to or pray for or pray with. And there have been times where God will put someone on my heart, not necessarily to go get in their face, but to pray for them consistently in my own prayer times. I'll make a sticky note, I'll put it somewhere in the house, and every time I see it, I pray for them. He may be prompting you to a new season of life. It may be some of you are in a, in a job situation, and he may be prompting you for what the next season is going to look like. Maybe it's something in your life that shouldn't be there. Maybe it's something in your life that should. As we close the message out, I'd like us to bow our heads, welcome the Holy Spirit into this place and into our lives, and just say, would you speak to me? Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you that your Holy Spirit is still moving and speaking and drawing people. We see it around the world. We see it in our own cultures. I think if we'll stop long enough and listen and pay attention, we see it in our own lives. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here this morning. And we ask that in these few minutes as we leave everything else to the side, as we forget about the game, as we forget about lunch, as we forget about the other stuff that, that's going on in our world and even in the day, that we would listen for the prompting of your Holy Spirit, that we would follow your guidance, and we would be faithful with any gift that you've given us, with any call that you've placed within us. In Christ's name we pray.